Thank you, uh, three gentlemen, for, for joining us today. I know that uh, Mike and I are always conspiring <laughs> uh, to uh, try to do um, some random cockamamie thing with beer. And I appreciate that everyone is always uh, uh, very much uh, willing and, and amenable to, to doing that. Um, thank you all for joining us. Uh, this is the official last virtual happy hour that we are hosting this year. Um, not counting the 32 events that we hosted over the four day beer culture summit. Um, I think this event puts us just at about 40 for the year. So it's been a busy year for us and not uh, possible without the great team we have here, including Ron and Mike, who are part of our League of Historians, uh, the people who are doing great research um, and keeping us informed in all things beer history and culture. Um, and again, I want to just thank everyone for joining and supporting us all year during this weird, weird year. Um, but I'm glad we were able to stay connected uh, more so than ever, uh, it seems, in, in, a, in a very odd and bizarre kind of way. Um, to those of you on Facebook, hi, hello, thanks for joining us. Um, both Zoom and Facebook participants, please use the chat uh, um, in the comment section to ask questions of um, our guests here today. Um, and that's kind of it. We're gonna let uh, Ron and Mike talk a little bit about the history of, of uh, Kohnbacher and then let Fabio talk about um, the collab he did with Ocelot and Lost Loggers. And just as a personal side note, because I can, I was very excited not only about um, any sort of uh, historic beer style that comes back, but one of my favorite bands ever is New Order. So when I saw that he called this Love Vigilantes, I kind of did a few somersaults <laughs> and said, yes, let's, let's, let's make something happen. So I appreciate that, Fabio, your, your incredibly yep. great taste in music. Good. Uh, <laughs> and with that, um, I'm just going to hand it over uh, to Ron, Mike, and Fabio to, to get this thing going. Excellent. Thank you, Liz. Um, well, thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, I am Mike Stein. I'm president of Lost Loggers. I'm very excited to introduce uh, Ron Pattinson and Fabio Garcia today. Um, so I'm going to begin uh, my our show here and I'm going to share my screen with all of you. Uh, like Liz said, you know, if you have questions or uh, comments, just leave them uh, in the chat and we will get right to it. All right. Uh, can you all see see my screen here? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very good. So um, the comeback of Kohlenbacher. This one I have to give credit to Liz for. Uh, she's good with alliteration. It just rolls right off the tongue. The comeback of Kohlenbacher. So uh, I'll start with Fabio here, and then we'll introduce Ron. Uh, Fabio is the gentleman uh, twice removed from the gentleman that looks like Santa Claus here. Uh, that's Bob Tupper for those playing along at home. But Fabio Garcia is director of brewing operations at Dynasty Brewing Company. He's also a founder there. Prior to Dynasty, he was production manager at Beltway Brew Co., director of brewing operations and founder of Lost Rhino Brew Co. And before that, he worked at Old Dominion Brew Co., where he was head brewer before the company moved production from Virginia to Delaware. Prior to that, he worked at Rich Brow in Richmond and began his career in Arlington at Bardo in 1995. Here, Fabio is pictured at the now closed Brickskeller, uh, the world famous Brickskeller beer bar in DC. Um, this was at the annual winter beer tasting, which was a longstanding tradition in the district. Um, so you've got Bob Tupper there next to Bob between Fabio is Jesse Brenneman and then Fabio there. And of note this year, Fabio in 2008 actually brewed a Baltic Porter. So he was ahead of his time with dark lager as, as, as far as the comebacks come. Uh, all right, moving right along. Here is Ron Pattinson. Ron Pattinson is a beer historian and a writer who's been covering beer for many years on his site. Shut up about barclayperkins.blogspot.com. You can go to that site. Um, seeing the books that he's authored, you can purchase Ron's work through his website. Um, he has recommended Decoction. That's the title of the book today to pair with our conversation about Kuhlenbacher. But I also highly recommend the Home Brewer's Guide to Vintage Beer, which I believe some folks joining us have read and have used some recipes to make uh, old beers that Ron's written. 
the recipes for. And uh, I just noticed Ron is running a deal on his books and it'll allow you 15% off if you use the code new you, all capital new you 15. Um, so I've been plugging away, but the last bit of the intro here is Ron uh, standing next to Lizzie Palumbo. And Lizzie was the longstanding taproom manager at DC Brow Brewing Company. Uh, Lizzie now lives, works and play on Jeju Island in South Korea. And before Lizzie left, I actually gave her a bottle of Ron's uh, uh, East German Porter that Ron brewed with uh, Jester King. So I gave Lizzie in DC a bottle of Texas Porter made from an old East German recipe that uh, she served to the Magpie Brewery in South Korea and everybody really loved. So Ron, your beer is big on Jeju Island, I am told. Uh, but on this day, specifically, this is in 2018, uh, Ron was at the DC Brow Brewing Company to brew um, a, a, a London Porter, uh, an 1858 London Porter. Um, and on that day, it was actually Ron's birthday and he brewed two beers that were brewed on his birthday in 1858 and 1857. The other is uh, Blue Jackets for the company, or excuse me, Company Porter, uh, which is at Blue Jacket and the Church Key Beer Shop. If you live in the Metro DC, you can get that as well as love vigilantes. Uh, I am Mike Stein, president of Lost Lagers. We're a beverage research firm here in DC. Uh, we provide drink makers with old recipes. Uh, and we're gonna talk about a recipe that Fabio uh, scaled up from an old recipe today. But uh, I should tell you, I cover beer for dcbeer.com and you can hear me bi-weekly on the DC Beer podcast. Okay, introductions, long-winded, but they're done. An outline of what we're gonna discuss today. Um, so we're gonna kick it off first with Ron, uh, then I'm gonna talk a little bit about Kulmbacher uh, in America, and then Fabio is gonna talk about how he took uh, both Ron and my research and uh, brewed a modern beer. Uh, so Ron, I'll turn it over to you now. Okay, so this is one of my, my <laughs> one of the tables, sorts of tables that I love, things with loads of information. So this has been extracted from a whole load of um, 19th century German publications. A lot of them, things like chemical magazines, um, so technical, things for technical chemists, which for some reason in Germany often have pages and pages of beer analyses, which I really love because uh, it gives you some idea about what the beers were like. And what I particularly liked about this set was that it confirmed a lot of the things that I'd read generally about Kumbacher, which was to say that it was mostly a dark beer, but obviously you've got some light versions there. Bail, some hell, hell that one. Oh, I've got house. Oh no, these are all dunklers. Um, but you see that the main distinguishing feature of Kumbacher is it was generally called export, but it was mostly around um bot beer strength so in most of germany it wouldn't have been called an export it would have been called a bot beer and these are this is one of the distinguishing features of kornbacher that it was a very strong beer for for lagers of the time very dark and very heavily hopped um, generally what you see is in bavaria that the further north you go so munich's relatively in the south and kornbach is in Franconia, which wasn't originally in Bavaria, only became part of Bavaria during the Napoleonic times and has quite a different beer culture from the rest of Bavaria. And so in the 19th century, most were well, in fact, at some periods, all the lagers were dark, um, but they varied in character depending on where you are. And the further north you got in Bavaria, the darker they got, the stronger they got, and the more heavily hot they got. And so one of the first times I was in Franconia, I kept saying, oh, kept writing in my tasting notes, oh, this is surprisingly hoppy for a, for a dark lager. And then I just realized, oh, well, this is actually the style in this uh, area. And they're not like the Munich beers, which are quite lightly hot. They're actually quite different in character. And Kornbacher beer, is probably the ultimate example of this. That, so it's the most extreme type of Franconian beer. So it's the strongest, it's the darkest, it's the most hoppy. And if you look at the hopping rate compared to say Munich lager, in Kornbach it was like three, four, five times as much. So very, very different. So it's not like this very malty 
sort of smooth, quite gentle beer. It's a beer that's got a lot of character. It's got character from the dark malt, and it's also got an awful lot of hops in it. And so it's 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 really a dist very distinctive style. It's like you could say, oh, you know, if, if you're looking at just the general Franconian dark lager, well, it's a little bit different from the Munich one, but not that much different. But the Kornbacher one really is quite different. And it seems to have made a, a, a big impression on people in the 19th century. So when you see that the, the first types of lager that start being brewed outside Southern Germany are, first off, it's either Vienna lager, which is the first one to make a big impression internationally, after you had this exhibition in Paris in the 1860s, where uh, Anton Dreyer's beer was a massive hit. You also have the Munich style of beer, that was also quite popular, but Kornbacher seems to be the other one. And it's really strange the way that Kornbacher was like this big, big recognized type of style of beer and everyone's forgotten about it. And it seems to have virtually completely disappeared from history. The thing being that no one in Kornback actually bre really brews a Kornbacher style beer anymore. They brew just the, 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 you know, the standard German styles. No one really brews a beer in what I would call the Kornbacher style, which is, you know, something that's 16 degrees Plato, virtually black, and with loads and loads of hops in it. Um, and so this just gives you some example of this. I mean, I, I mean, another thing that's worth noting here is that you might see from the um, <clears throat> the attenuation is mostly really poor, which is very typical of 19th century lagers that you rarely get any of us 70%. You've got the odd one, but you know, 60 odd percent, that was fairly standard for lagers in the 19th century. The only exception being um, some of the Bohemian beers where they were generally 75%, they were generally a bit better attenuated, but mostly it's re a really poor level of attenuation. Um, maybe we can move on to the next slide. <laughs> Yeah, so 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 come back. It, it was pretty famous in Germany, and I mean you've still got a, a fairly big brewery there. Though I think they all emerged into just a single brewery in Kornbach. Um and it had a name for itself, and it had a name for itself elsewhere. One of the weirdest things I ever came across was when I was looking through some old labels from Heineken to see that they brewed a Kornbacher, and they brewed it really early, so like in the 1870s. In fact, I think it might have even predated their Pilsner, <coughs> which gives you some idea about how famous the style was. Um, I mean, this is one of the things people don't tend to realize that Pilsner really took off very, very slowly. So in most places, the first lagers to be brewed were Bavarian style dark lagers, most places outside Bavaria, either that or things that were imitating Vienna lagers. Um, pale lagers in most of Germany they only started brewing Pilsner in the 1880s, 1890s, so quite late. And it wasn't a very big beer style for quite a long while. It was very much a, a, an expensive, um, it, was, it, it was a bit like pale ale in Britain. So things like B Burton pale ale, that wasn't what you, you know, your coal miner drank down the pub. This is what your middle class person drank at home out of a bottle or when they were in the saloon bar. So they were quite posh beers and they were expensive and Pilsner was the same way. So the beers that most people drank were the darker lagers, which weren't quite as fashionable and which were more everyday beers. Uh, you can flick over to the next slide. Uh, oh yes, that's my book. This is a, a, a wonderful little illustration by my son. I always, my one son does most of my book covers um, just so they don't look like anyone else's. It's just a crappy photograph originally that he's he'd made it made something that, uh, a bit nicer out of. But, but I mean, my, my book decoction is, is fairly crazy. It's got lots of things on, the reason it's called decoction is, I got obsessed with decoction uh, mashing methods, especially when I started reading all these 19th century German books and realized that, well, there wasn't just double decoction and triple decoction. There are actually dozens of different ways of decocting and virtually every town had a, a, a different way of doing it. And so I just started recording them uh, on my blog and then I put them into this book and then I threw in a whole load of other stuff. So it's not even all about lager. There's a lot of stuff about um, German top fermenting beer styles, especially the ones that have disappeared, which is most of them. 
Um, so it's quite a strange book. It's got a, it, it's got a lot of stuff about lager and early lager development, and then it's also got a, a lot of stuff about um, uh, disappeared German beer styles, which also so also obsessed me, especially Breuhan. I mean, Breuhan, which was it's another beer where people completely forgot about. For two or three hundred years, it was the most popular beer style in North Germany, and then just disappeared without trace uh, at, at the start of the 20th century. So it's even weirder than Kornbacher because Breuhan was around for so long. It, I mean, I think it started off in the in the 16th century, so it had a very long history and just completely went, probably because of some of the characteristics of it. This is the photograph that that comes from, which was taken in, in one of the most beautiful settings to drink beer in the whole of Germany. This is Spital in Regensburg. If you can see the water in the background, that's the that's the Danube. So absolutely stunning setting the beer garden there. And they have a really nice dark beer. And the only, uh, only meatballs I've ever had that were better than my wife's. So <laughs> a, a wonderful place. <laughs> We can do the next slide. Oh, this is you now. Well said. Yeah. Um, no, that was great. Thank you, Ron. Um, I'll say one of the things that I always do is is uh, send Ron an email uh, about whatever I'm researching. And most recently, it's been Kumbacher. And the fact that Heineken made one uh, was of great interest, of course. Um, and then even more interesting was that Heineken actually spelled the name of the beer Kuhlenbacher, which of course in German has a K, with a C. Uh, and that kind of uh, mimicked what I had seen, or I should say maybe the U.S. mimicked them. Um, these are some late 19th century. Uh, the one on the left is late 19th. The one on the right is uh, early 20th century. Uh, labels for Kuhlenbacher Dark Lager, which was brewed uh, right here where I am today in, in Washington, D.C. Um, and so asking Ron about Kuhlenbacher was, is, is always a great, it, it's great to kind of juxtapose the German and the American, but it's important to remember it was brewed in the Netherlands as well. Um, so we know for at least, we know for a fact, at least three countries manufactured it. Um, how many more? And that's to be determined. We'll, <laughs> we'll go down that path uh, at a later date. Um, but basically I, I have these slides here to show you how it was advertised in the US. Um, and in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the ad copy literally says heavy in body, rich in nutriment and health giving qualities, a faultless tonic to build up and strengthen frail weak systems. So clearly there was, there were a number of frail weak systems uh, in, 18, in the 1890s and they needed to be built up. Uh, Kuhlenbacher was one way to do that. Um, but the key word here is tonic because at this point in time, the late 1800s, early 1900s, this is pre-prohibition in the United States before the manufacture, sale, and transport of beer uh, is made illegal, uh, is made federally illegal and locally illegal to some extent. Um, uh, but, but the point being that tonics might have been non-alcoholic or have a much lesser percentage of alcohol. Um, so in Ron's assembly of the table, um, outside of the German uh, chemical analysis, he actually used uh, the American Handy Book of Brewing, Malting, and Auxiliary Trades, which was written by Robert Wall uh, and Max Hennius. Um, and in, in this case published, I have a, a 1902 edition. I think the first edition was 1901. Um, and then of course, in, in Ron's chemical analysis, a number of the beers were much earlier than 1902. They were from the late 1870s. Um, but the point being that Wall and Hennius described Kuhlenbacher as quote, Kuhlenbacher, a very dark beer with the Bavarian characteristics, especially accentuated brewed along the lines of a Bavarian lager from a very strong original balling of wort about 16 to 18%. So we expect a strong beer, a strong alcoholic beer, but then in the 1902 American Handy Book, Wall, uh, Wall and Hennius go on to describe Kuhlenbacher under malt, malt tonics. And they write, these beers are made of a dark color, some having the general characteristics of a heavy brewed Bavarian beer like Kulmbacher, for instance, with a pronounced malt flavor and Swedish taste, a high percentage of alcohol and relatively small percentage of extract. Others having the same general characteristics, but a low percentage of alcohol and high percentage of extract. 
The latter type is brewed and fermented like the former, but receives a larger percentage of croissant or wort in the chip cask. Um, they go, so malt tonic. Is Kulmbacher a malt tonic, a beer with low alcohol and high extract? Or is it uh, more along the lines of, it, as it were in Germany, high alcohol and lower extract? And again, that's going to vary in America state by state, city by city. Uh, once I started to search the Library of Congress, I realized Kulmbacher was brewed all the way from San Francisco to New York City. Um, so you, you had a breweries in Brooklyn and Manhattan, uh, multiple breweries throughout the state of California, the massive state of California, all manufacturing this dark lager. So of course, it's going to be different from coast to coast if you have, let's say you only had 100 breweries making 100 Kulmbachers. Well, of course, they're going to be different. Um, to meet the demand of that city, of, of the local brewing uh, customers, right? Um, so uh, I should say the last paragraph that Wall and Hennius talk about that I want to mention, under malt tonics, they say malt tonics are generally put up in bottles, attractively labeled and usually distributed by druggists. If such tonics are advertised for use for medicinal purposes and so sold by the retailer in good faith, not as beverages, and if they really are medicinal preparations, the druggists will not require the United States retail liquor dealer's license to sell the articles. So kind of, uh, kind of a workaround, if you will. <laughs> Leading up to prohibition, of course, this is 1902. Prohibition won't come for another 18 years, but um, if they're sold in bottles with attractive labels, they're kind of posh. And that's kind of the reverse trajectory that Ron mentioned. You know, if you think about the working class having having a beer down the pub, um, you know, it, it's primarily dark beer. Pale ale is more so uh, the drink of the middle class, right? If we're thinking about beer in terms of class, so we've kind of now begun this this reversal of pale beer, beer being the posh beer to dark beer being the posh beer. It's not completely accurate. It's just something that I've noticed in in the start of the research. Um, the research isn't complete and we'll see where it takes me when it's finished, but um, here's an artist's rendering of the brewery in DC that manufactured Kohlenbacher. Um, so the Washington Brew Co, Washington Brewery Company in 1894, um, they first launched Kohlenbacher in 1898. So this is four years before they launched it. Um, and actually before it was the Washington Brew Co, it was the Mount Vernon Lager Beer Brewery. So it was an entire block, a whole city block in DC. Um, half of the block was the brewery. The other half was a, a beer garden, what, what would become known as the Alhambra Beer Garden. Um, and the, the garden restaurant entertainment could hold up to a thousand seats. So when you think about the, the different brewery models we have out there, are you a production brewery and you send beer out into the world? Are you a brew pub or a small taproom based brewery and the majority of your sales are over the bar at your brewery? Well, if you have a beer garden, that kind of takes fantastic advantage of the selling your beers direct to consumer model. Um, and this was an early example of that. Um, it's, a so very like German, said, it's a very German way of doing things, actually. You, you see all the, all the Bavarian breweries, they, they virtually all have beer gardens. Precisely, precisely. It's it's a it's a, a cheap copying of the of the uh, Bavarian model, of the German model. Um, so uh, we know that Kulmbacher was new in 1898. They advertised it as a new product. Um, interestingly, uh, the brewery was bought in 1889 by a British Brit by a Brewish Brit excuse me a British brewing syndicate. Um, and it's really interesting. I won't go into that detail, but we believe it's the same syndicate that bought uh, Frank Jones. Frank Jones was a cream ale brewer in Rhode Island and in Boston. He had dual breweries. They bought uh, Valentin Blatz's brewery in Milwaukee. Um, so they were just buying up breweries around the U.S. Um, and according to the ad, I, I found the ad on the London Stock Exchange, and it said, quote, American lager beer breweries possess great advantages over others as thin light beer is the national drink of the United States. But Kulmbacher was not thin and it was not light. So we know that, um, and that ad actually comes from the 1889 London Stock Exchange offering um, that the syndicate put for the Washington Brewing Company. Um, we know by 1890, they expanded and increased the plant production to 100,000 barrel capacity. 
Uh, the year before in 1889, the Wash Bruco uh, brewed 36,000 barrels. So pretty soon after the syndicate takes over, they begin to expand the brewery. Um, we also know that when the brewery was built in 1865, uh, they dug tunnels underground to begin to have a place to lager. Uh, because in 1865, at least in Washington, DC, uh, there's no artificial refrigeration. Um, Ron and I have had many talks about um, uh, attemperators, right? Because the idea that lager couldn't exist before machine manufactured cooling, you know, and, and this is kind of the work that uh, Ron and, and also uh, Andreas Krenmeier now, uh, his Vienna lager book, you know, people put beer in cold places before they had refrigerated uh, a, a manufactured cool fermentation control. But even before that, there was fermentation control. And this is some of the work that, that, that Ron's done that, that to me is needs done. <laughs> the beer world has benefited from it with this kind of myth busting. Um, so here we have the Washington Brew Co. in 1910. Um, this is what it actually looked like. This is how it was, you know, I, the artist rendering is so much more beautiful than real life, but, but this is a- The a classic photo. thing that they do in all, the, all, all these drawing things of breweries is they always make them look much bigger than they really were. That's it, that's it. So the, you're looking at basically a whole city block here. Um, this front being the beer garden, uh, the white building with uh, the, the sort of deck railing on top, and then the massive, you know, very much German styled uh, gravity fed brew house on, on the top of the hill, um, which makes sense if you consider that there were lager caves. The question is, are there still lager caves? That one uh, remains to be seen, but I'm, <laughs> I'm waiting on the DC uh, Archaeological Society to get back to me on that one. My, my um, guess would be that they're still there because it's just yeah. too much trouble to, to fill them in. Yeah, so when Pete, uh, Pete Jones, my colleague in Lost Loggers and I researched this, we found uh, in the 1920s during Prohibition, when they demolitioned uh, the brewery, there was some question if the property purchaser owned it or if the city needed to fill the tunnels in so that the grounds would be stable. Um, and, and basically what they found is that it took 70 sticks of dynamite to, to explode the brewery in 1925. Um, this is, of course, in the middle of American Prohibition, generally 1920, 1933. So in 1925, it took 70 dynamite sticks to bring this, this massive uh, brewery and beer garden down. Um, and so today it's Stuart Hobson Middle School. Uh, and right there where the pillars are at the front of the school, that is 410 E Street and 410 E Street uh, was the address. You can kind of tell the building slopes downward. So um, uh, that's F Street at the far end. This is E Street in the, in the front. Um, and yeah, you know, what's underneath it. So you can, this is an aerial shot, the turf field, the soccer or the football pitch uh, is where we, we assume the logger caves were. Stuart Hobson Middle School, you can see up front here, uh, Fifth Street on the right, Fourth Street on the left. Um, so the question remains, and, and I hope we get to crack that, that historic nut um, if the 1865 logger tunnels <laughs> still exist. Um, but it's just interesting because the site where a number of kids, uh, not currently because we're doing virtual school, but where a number of kids are enrolled as middle schoolers was once a brewery and a beer garden. And I think that to me is what's most interesting. And that brewery actually manufactured Kulmbacher. Um, so, okay, enough of history, enough of American history. Uh, I want, I was hoping to turn it over to Ron. You can tell us a little bit about this recipe. Yeah, this is, this is the recipe I put together when I did my, um, finally, finally got a, uh, the historic lager festival off the ground, which I've been trying to do for years and years and years. And eventually it happened at Urban Chestnut in St. Louis, which is a really, really good American lager brewery. And they got beers brewed from all over. Um, so it was quite good. We got quite, quite a few really interesting breweries to brew beer, but the Kulmbacher was one of the ones I most wanted to try. And I'm tr trying now to remember who the hell it was who brewed it. Um, uh, shells, uh, uh, shells, oh, shells Min yeah, Minnesota. Yeah. Oh yeah, and, and what a cool brewery that is. Have you ever been there? 
Uh, I have not. I, I at the last Bruzeum Summit, I finally got to meet uh, Mr. Berg, and you know, Shells, if you don't know, is one of America's oldest. Uh, New Ulm, uh, Minnesota. There is a strain of yeast called the New Ulm strain uh, after Shells, and and they are historic in their own rights. So they it, they made made this beer. It's it's a wonderful place, Shells. It's it's one of the most impressive breweries I've been to. Um, I've got all the signs still up in German, so it says sort of like Kessel House and stuff. It's it's, it's really weird, um, but I mean, they, they, it's still owned by the same family who founded it in the 1840s, I think 1850s. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the name's not the, the same because it went through the female line at one point, so they're called Marty now, the surname. Uh, but a wonderful place, uh, really. If, if it's, it's an absolute treasure. One, one of these things that it's like FX Matt as well, which is another Amer amazing old American brewery, which weirdly loads of people don't seem to know about in, in the States. I, right. I really can't understand that, given how important FX Matt were in, in the whole microbrewery um, story, seeing as they contract brewed stuff for lots and lots of people in the early days and still brew most of the Brooklyn beer. Um, but Sh Shells is a smaller brewery, but just wonderful. Um, I, I absolutely love the place. Really enthusiastic about their beers. They are, but very, very committed to, you know, to keeping traditions going. Um, brilliant. Uh, one of the things that most impressed me about their brewery was that they got a Von Linder ice machine. So one of the very early um, artificial refrigeration machines from the 1870s. They got one of them. I'm, I'm pretty sure it wasn't still working, but still, still impressive to see one of those things anywhere. Um, <clears throat> so they brewed this beer up, which was absolutely wonderful. Um, I really, really liked it. I, I, I wouldn't have expected anything less because they're a, a very good brewer, brewery and they, they know their lager, um, which is very important. I mean, it's one of the things I find heartening is that there's definitely a comeback of people trying to brew lager properly in the US. Um, I mean, in Chicago, you're dead lucky because you've got uh, Dovetail which is, brews absolutely wonderful lagers. Um, their Hellers is the best Hellers I've ever tasted that wasn't brewed in Germany. And it was better than a lot of the Hellers brewed in Germany. A really wow. wonderful drinking beer that I could have just sat and drank the whole day, which actually that's, might have been what happened. That's I high remember. praise. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, we, we love the Dovetail group. We actually had the Chicago Bruzium Summit there in 2019. And I've got uh, my dovetail uh, porcupine dimpled mug here. So oh. cheers to dovetail. And <laughs> yeah. I mean, what, what, what dovetail proves to me is that process is important because they've got a traditional lager brewery. They, they, they've got a cool ship, they decoct, they open ferment, and they have horizontal lagering tanks. And the beer tastes different from the way, from the lagers you taste with people that have got an ale setup where they just have you know everything set up to really brew british style beers rather than lagers and yeah it, it, <coughs> it proves to me that there's a point in all that stuff because their beers definitely taste different and they definitely taste like german beers um which isn't the case i yeah you know people who just brew the you, you know just brew a hobby pilsner on the side and they're really an ale brewery well often they don't taste that good. Um, but with Dovetail, they really do. Um, and and, and I'm, I'm hoping this is gonna get, get more popular in the States because lagers are wonderful beers and they're accessible beers and people like them, but you have to brew them right. If, if you just brew them in the, with the wrong setup, then you, you lose all the wonderful character that a good lager has. Um, and especially lagering. I know a lot of people say that lagering doesn't really matter nowadays, but I, I would disagree with that. I know that when I've been in, one of the things I, I, I did when I went around Franconia a, a few years ago, every time I went to a brewery, I'd ask them what their lagering times were. And in general, the longer the lagering time was, the better the beers tasted, in my opinion. Um, so it's, it's, it's not, a, not, not just a random stupid thing that they do in Germany, it really does matter if you lager beers properly. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, I don't know how long this was. I think this was lagered quite a long while, actually, This, this uh, the Shells beer, because mm. they do stuff seriously. 
Um, I think that's me done with talking about the, this bit. I can talk about Very manga good. generally if you want. <laughs> um, sure. Uh, I was going to say that, um, you know, we, um, oh, good. Uh, uh, thank you for posting the link there. Yes, yeah, Stan uh, Hieronymus wrote about the Shells Kuhlenbacher. So that's in the, the chat there. Um, yeah, so uh, one of the things I mentioned when I always reach out to Ron is to provide him what the research looks like. And here you'll see four recipes with Kuhlenbacher at the bottom. Um, so right off the bat, I knew I'm gonna jump around here, but you know, Ron's recipe has two malts. Um, and granted it's, you know, uh, 40 years later from this recipe to this one, but uh, this recipe had, had four malts comparatively to the two. Um, and Ron was really helpful in identifying why that might be. There are still a number of mysteries surrounding this recipe. So I should back up and say, uh, this recipe comes from the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. Uh, they have an archive there. Uh, in the archive, uh, there's a collection called the Voigt Collection. Uh, and Walter Voigt was a, a master brewer, an MBAA member. He is a, a Siebel graduate. He graduated from Siebel, I think right before prohibition in, in 1919 or maybe even 1920. Um, and this was kind of sandwiched between his Siebel notes and his commercial brewing. And, you know, if you think about prohibition, it's a terrible time to be a brew to start brewing is during a, a, a period um, when, when America goes uh, from a massive uh, trimming, uh, you know, in terms of the number of breweries to, to having far fewer breweries after prohibition. Um, but it's really interesting that the Kuhlenbacher type here is spelled with a K and not with a C. Um, the same with Munich. They don't say Munich type, they say Munchner type. Um, and, you know, and, and it's Pilsen type. And it, there, that, that shows the respect, the type of beer you're brewing a Pilsen type. Um, you know, I, I love when I see Kuhlenbacher type or uh, Pilsner style beer today. Um, Fabio put in the Kuhlenbacher style on our beer. And I just love that. I think it shows respect um, and, and, it's, and it's enjoyable. But so anyway, so this recipe is, uh, for the types of near beer, and near beer, of course, is non-alcoholic or mostly uh, less alcohol than, you know, sort of normal strength beer. Usually uh, half, in modern times, a half of 1%, 0.5 ABV. Um, but so we had four malts, um, and Fabio used four malts in his, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it over to you, Fabio, uh, since you are the expert. This is his handwriting, uh, 100 years after the last uh, recipe was written. Right, so it's great to, to get that, that recipe pretty well straight out, uh, you know, pounds per barrel. So it's a good starting point when developing a recipe. And this is a, this beer is a collaboration with uh, the brewery Ocelot, which is uh, our neighbors down the street in, uh, in Northern Virginia, and then Mike and, from Las Lager. So we have a connection that uh, Jack, the brewer at uh, Ocelot and Mike went to school together, with the grad school together. So as soon as, uh, so, we do occasionally do collaboration beers in uh, uh, Ocelot and, and Dynasty, where I'm brewing at. We're known for our, our hoppy beers. And then we did a collaboration before. And of course, it was a you know, real hoppy IPA. It uh, came out great. But uh, since I have a little more control of what I can brew at Dynasty, since I'm the only brewer and one of, one of, the, uh, one of the owners, uh jack's like we got to do a lager together it's like absolutely and then it's like let's rope in mike in this it's like all right great so mike suggested hey look at these uh look at these uh recipes and see what you guys think and we uh, decided to go with the dark lager um so it's uh it's pretty straightforward but then when you, you see the recipe mike could go back to the, the the previous slide on the recipe you got the uh, high dried malt and pale malt um, you know, there's no numbers attached to these things. So if we go back to the uh, the recipe that we brewed, or at least our notes, uh, we had to make some decisions of what they were, right? So uh, you went for uh, Pilsner malt and Vienna malt. So Pilsner malt for the the pale malt, and then uh, the high dry malt. We chose to use Vienna. Um, we could have used Munich. Uh, just a kind of personal preference on my part. Mike and I talked a little bit about that. Um, it's just that uh, the malt came from a bolster in Virginia. So this is, we used Virginia grown pale barley malt. Uh, it's, uh, it's malted in uh, Charlottesville. Uh, it's kind of an interesting project. Uh, the Murphy and Roots going on. Jeff from Murphy and Roots 
it's been contracting uh, farmers around the, the state and then of course parts of Maryland and North Carolina to grow some uh, some uh, high quality brewing barley, which is difficult to grow in, uh, in Virginia in the Southeast of the United States since it's uh, so wet at the wrong times necessarily. So uh, harvest can be difficult and um, he's got some great malt. So we did, chose to go with them and that was something that Jack and I wanted to really uh, use some Virginia grown uh, Pilsner and, and then we went for the Vienna malt. So the Vienna tends to be a little bit lighter than the Munich. And then, so the next step, you got to figure out what caramel malts to use. And I went for like a standard like caramel 40, go the road caramel malt. And then once again, there's no numbers on that dark malt recipe. Uh, but uh, so, but we went, we stayed with the German carafa, which shows up in some of Ron's, the recipes that Ron's found in the carafa. Uh, so the de bittered ones, we've got we not too much roast flavor out of it. Um, so we stayed pretty true to the recipe. Uh, there's a couple variations as far as the percentages, uh, but it's pretty close to what uh, we kind of upped the dark malt a little bit to make sure that it came out very dark, kind of. Uh, I like the description that Ron, uh, you know, pointed out that it was in the in the research as far as very dark and hoppy. So I, I want to make sure that the beer was very dark, and uh, and it's also very interesting that you know, it's like Mike mentioned that the the beer is also uh, clean and then uh, heavy in body. So that kind of uh, went for we went to a, a particular lager strain that is uh, low attenuation that. Uh, leaves a lot of sugars behind. So we have some nice, but it's also very, it's known to making clean Bach beers. So we kind of use like a Bach lager strain uh, from a German monastery, the Andex. So it kind of worked out well, it all came together. Um, the hopping rates was difficult uh, to figure out because, you know, what does hoppy mean in the modern term uh, and as opposed to in the past? Uh, once again, we're not dealing with any precise numbers of IBUs. We're just saying, oh, this beer is happy. I mean, well, it's happy depends on what who's drinking it, right? Uh, uh, so we did dry hop this beer, which is probably not traditional. Um, but uh, oh, here's the our setup. Uh, we'll go back a little bit. This is our setup for the brew house. So talk about Ron was talking about brew house setups, and this is uh, this system was built. Uh, even though Dynasty is only a few years old, uh, this brew house was built in 1996. It is very much set up for an uh, American brew pub system. Uh, it can make great amber ales. <laughs> it's kind of pretty much what it's designed for. It was in Seattle, it's, uh, from a rock bottom in Seattle. And then we purchased and moved to, uh, to Virginia. So to do a decoction, I can't really decoct in a traditional sense of moving uh, the mash to the boil kettle, but I would uh, I move the, the wort to the boil kettle, bring it to a boil, and just move it back to the to the mash, and just raising the temperature of the mash in three different steps. That is actually described in some of, of Ron's uh, research. I think Ron can probably go more into detail into that, but I kind of flip it through his blog and some of his books, and there, there's some so uh, interesting, I thought that was pretty interesting to be able to do that, just pull the ward out, bring it to a boil, and bring it back to the mash. Um, at that point, add some hops into the boil kettle. And that's when the far, the picture on the far right there is the getting to, ready to boil. And you can see we reached our final mash out temperature at about 165 after beginning at uh, like 131. They had like a middle temperature and then we mashed out. Um, the next slide, it's kind of interesting to brew and doing a pandemic. Uh, normally, you would uh, get together, right? First, you would get together to have a conversation and drink a beer and two and figure out what we want to do. Um, but we're all trying to be safe and stay healthy. So we had a lot of text messages and emails uh, going back and forth. Uh, and actually, that worked out really well because it, it kind of gave everyone time to absorb the information and get back to you. Like, you weren't, like, uh, constant communication. In fact, it's like, hey, I got, you know, this, we got a framework what to do with the beer, but then uh, uh, going back and forth to Dallas to develop the recipe uh, in a calm manner and without any, any sudden changes. Of course, there was always uh, changes in the, the brew day, which 
I made some changes because I was the only one brewing. Like I added a little bit more Pilsner malt than it should have, but I want to get that gravity a little bit higher. You see some of the text messages going back and forth. Yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, I added yeah. a little bit of a Pilsner malt. <laughs> I, I should add that while you know everything is different because it's uh, La Vida Pandemica uh, right now, um, Ron, I remember some of your early collabs with um, Pretty Things. And you and uh, Mr. Paquette, and he would say, oh, I mashed, you know, mash is complete. And, and you'd say, show me a wart sample. <laughs> and he would bring it and you'd say, this is too pale. We need, we need more color. And so I think Fabio shows the color change here. If you look, you know, from the left to the right, yeah. the final product, it's pretty dark. So obviously changes were made uh, during brew day throughout the brewing process. But it just reminded me back to the, those pretty things, those, those dark beers you had brewed with pretty things to, to really lock in the color. Uh, but, well, one of the other interesting things about Kohlenbacher is I've got this thing from, from around 1900 where um, th there was like, th there were people like, um, what do you call it, like um, trading standards people in Germany looking at various beers and they got these samples of Kohlenbacher and they were suspicious that they'd been watered down because they were too pale. And they analyzed them and they find, oh, well, no, they hadn't been watered down. They were the right strength. And so they asked the brewers, why aren't these beers as dark as we'd expect? And they said, oh, well, there was this court case a few years ago in Bayreuth where they stopped us using caramel to color it. <laughs> so they'd been using sugar in Bavaria to color beer, which is not very Reinheitsger <laughs> boats. Um, and I'm assuming what they went on to do after that was color it with cinema, which is basically mm -hmm. the the uh, workaround for caramel. Um, yes. But it was really odd to see that that Bavarian brewers admitting that they'd used sugar in their beer. Yeah, yeah, that's a big uh, expose front front page headlines of the Brewing Times. Yeah. Verboten. <laughs> yeah, well, that, yeah, that, well, don't get me started on the Reinheitsger boat. <laughs> I will. Um, and, and how but brewers I'll... have fiddled it over the years and the other things that they've allowed. It's, you, you, I, I could talk for two hours just about the Reinheitsger boat and, and the well, history of it. And how, uh, yeah, how, yeah, it's. Um... I'll, I'll say this, Ron, that that um, along those lines of beer color, uh, what what I've found, uh, and my colleague Pete, our lost loggers research has been, you know, in American brewing there was brewed porter and racking room porter, right? And so the racking room is where the beer goes uh, from, uh, goes into package, be that you know, uh, cask, kegs, bottles, or cans. Uh, so, so the beer might be pale going into the racking room, but it's porter color when it leaves. Well, um, but there's, so, there's, there's lots of that stuff went on. Look, yeah, I've, and I've, it still I've, goes on today. Uh, yeah, I've got, I've got Scottish breweries, right? Scottish breweries in the 20th century, most of them after World War I, all they brewed were pale ales, right? So they just party guile together three, three or four pale ales of different strengths. It's all they brewed. Yet I'll say that some of these breweries, I'll find analyses or labels for stout that they were brewing. So how the hell were they doing this? <laughs> well, well, they were doing it exactly the same way. All except in Britain, you had, it wasn't just putting colouring in. You had specialist brewing sugars that would give your beer a stout flavor. So it'd have some roastiness in it and everything. So you just sling this stuff, stuff in at racking time in exactly the same way. And hey, presto, you've ch changed your watery uh, pale ale into a really watery stout. Um, right. <laughs> so, so brewers have yeah. always done lots of this. It's, it's, yes. the same with, it's the same with dark mild. Most dark mild never had anything darker in it than crystal malt. All the color comes from sugar. It comes from number three invert sugar, and it comes from caramel. And mm -hmm. it was a complete revelation for me. One time when I, when I was doing this thing with Fuller's, and they'd act, they got some brewing sugars so I could taste the brewing sugar. And when I tasted number three, I realized that that was the flavor of dark mild. 
Um, what I thought came from dark sugars, dark malts, actually came from number three invert sugar. And that was the complete character of most dark malts, that and caramel. And it had nothing whatsoever to do with dark malts. And mm -hmm. when I drink dark milds in the United States, unfortunately, most of the American brewers have read the crap that other people have written about dark mild. <laughs> and they try to color it up with dark malt and it never tastes right because they're not using the right ingredients and they're not brewing it the same way. So they're trying to brew it all malt to brew it nicely, but you can't get the right character of the beer doing it that way. Yeah. It's the same way as if you brew some of the light pale ales in Britain. So AK being one of the typical ones. If you don't use flaked maize and invert sugar, it doesn't taste right. If you brew it all malt, you don't get the right beer. Mm. And yeah, too uh, many people in the in, in the modern brewing world. Well, they'll, they'll throw all sorts of other shit in nowadays. So all, all sorts of <laughs> you know lactose and crap, but they won't use brewing sugars, which is specifically designed to get certain flavors into the beer. They don't like yeah. that, and they don't like flaked maize. But they'll throw all sorts of other rubbish into the beers. Yeah. So um, yeah, I find it quite well, amusing. I, we are very much team uh, praise the maze. That's our game here at Lost Loggers. <laughs> uh, Fabio's brewed some wonderful adjunct loggers with rice and barley. Um, but I will say that hearing that, Ron, it makes me think of um, uh, my colleague Pete was researching this brewery in Philly, the Common, uh, Commonwealth Brewing Company. And they had three beers. They had Pilsner, uh, Munich, and Porter. And all three of those beers came from the same mash, 70% barley, 30% corn. The Munich had a pint of porterine. The porter had a gallon of porterine per barrel. That's all it was. So you can see the same thing, roughly the same time, kind of from 1905 to 1915, that it's happening. You know, the British Isles are in Scotland. It's also happening in Philadelphia. Well, they were um, doing it, and they were doing it in Germany as well. This is the other thing. One of the other things I've got about Kornbacher is there was this brewery in Germany that was done for having fake Kornbacher. And basically what they did was they brewed a pale lager and then they just used various amounts of this, um, um, basically something like cinema to either get Munich, Kornbacher or Porter. It just depended on how much of this stuff, this stuff you put in, it was which beer you got in the end. <laughs> right. So it's, it's, it's been going on everywhere. Um, yeah, most drinkers are incredibly naive about, about how their beers brewed. Yeah, <laughs> understandably. Uh, Fabio, I have the last slide. I think this is yeah, that's, yeah, that's, uh, uh, yes. Would uh, just uh, in this particular beer with uh, with the uh, classic uh, European varieties, you know, uh, German Pearl and Saz and Tetney, and then I, like I mentioned, the the East strain to get that uh, multi finish, that low attenuation, lower attenuation lager strain. Um, so this beer didn't particularly lager very long, but it's aging beautifully. So it's kind of a, one of those uh, at the right alcohol level, about 6%. Like it's perfect for storage and it has nice stability to it. So I'm looking forward to it, see how it develops. It's going to be good. Um, uh, questions. We have, we already have uh, one or two here. Uh, questions in our chat. Okay, um, Brian is asking, uh, he has a 1910 description of, uh, pardon the pronunciation, a uh, San Le Boy, San Le Bo, uh, Kumbacher as Volz, Ron, you're gonna have to read that. Would you say that oh, Kumbacher uh, basically- uh, Very good. Would you say that Kumbacher basically means a strong dark beer, just that the way that Albany Ale didn't mean one type of beer, but had a reputation of quality, and what is the relationship of Kumbacher to Schwarzbier? Oh God, um, I, I will say now that I would love to know the history of Schwarzbier, but I mm. don't, and I don't really know where it comes <laughs> from. Um, unfortunately, but you could say that it's both brewed and died, or racking room and brewed. Yeah, um, the I, commercial. I, 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 I just don't know the history of, of Schwarz beer. And yeah. <coughs> I'm, I'm not going to pretend that I don't. Um, <laughs> I, don't I don't know if it was originally a top fermented beer or it's always always been a mm. lager. <coughs> I, I mean, to be honest, they don't come, they come from reasonably close to each other. 
because Schwarzbier is from Turingen, which is where my wife's from. Yeah. Um, and that's basically just above Bavaria. And Kornbach comes from the very northern bit of, quite a northern bit of Bavaria. So mm. they are geographically quite close. But I mm. don't know if there's any connection between the two. Unfortunately, I wish yeah. I did. It's a, what, one of the many things I would like to know is more about Schwarzbier. And I've tried to research this and I've had real trouble finding any proper information about it at all. Um, yeah. Well, it's a, it's a good question. I think the, the thing about uh, Schwarzbier that at least we get in the US, we know imported Schwarzbier, it's pretty, uh, the way it's been explained to me is it's pale beer that's brewed dark with, with Cinnamar. Or there are dark malts in the mash tun and it comes into the cellar dark. You know, it leaves the, the kettle or leaves the brew house and goes into the fermenter dark. Um, I don't know. Similarly, Ron, I know nothing about the history of, of Schwarzbier. Yeah, I, I, in... I, mean, I mean, the thing is that, that, especially during the East German period, it wouldn't have been colored with cinema because I don't think they could get cinema because that's a West German mm -hmm. product. Yeah. So the chances are it was just colored with, would, if, it was, if they were going to color it, they'd have just colored it with caramel because they didn't have any Reinheitsgebot yeah. in East Germany. Um, yeah. That would be my guess. Um, yeah, but I, I, yeah. I well, well, one thing I, I failed to mention um, about Kumbacher, the first import of Kumbacher beer from Germany to the United States that, that I found was, was in 1864. And this is in the middle of the Civil War. I've never found any Schwartz beer in the United States. Um, I don't know, prior to, to 19, the 20th century for, for certain. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, Schwarz beer was, was fairly obscure. I mean, you, you, I, I only know of one brewery that really made it, which was Kustritzer. Um, mm -hmm. And it wasn't all they brewed. I mean, they used to brew, a, I've, I've got Kustritzer labels for a whole, whole load of different styles, because I, mm -hmm. I, I, I collect East German beer labels. So I've got loads and loads of, I've, I've got a fairly good idea of what sort of beers were, were being brewed by the different breweries and they brewed a whole range of styles and, and Schwarzbier was just one of them and it seems to have become more of a thing towards the end of the East German period that they concentrated on that and I think since then they pretty much completely concentrated on it. Mm -hmm. um, I would, yeah I think I, I would say just in our interpretation of the Kohnbacher to our, the, the modern Schwarzbier is that we are heavy on the on the malt so it's a lot maltier um, I mean, you, you would, if you put, put, put together a short beer recipe now, you would not use that much caramel malt or Vienna malt, right? So it would be more like a Pilsner with some dark malt added. Uh, so it's almost like, a, yeah, like a, a dark Pilsner in a sense, um, but pretty light overall. Yeah, I mean, my, my, yeah I mean, my feeling of, 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 of um, Schwarz beer, well, Kustritzer, is it's, it's a fairly light bodied beer. Um, yeah doesn't really have much in the way of dark malt character. It, yeah. Um, so my guess is it it doesn't have a great amount of dark malt in it, but I don't really know, um, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, the, the second part of the question was, um, is it similar, is Kohlenbacher similar, um, let me get the exact phrasing, to the way in which Albany Ale uh, didn't mean one type of beer, but had a reputation of quality? I would say absolutely because uh, you know there's Kulmbacher pale and Kulmbacher dark and yeah, right. I mean, but, but I mean, I think that, that when generally when the term Kulmbacher was used, especially outside Germany, I think it was specifically for a dark beer. Um, so even though they, yeah, I, I mean, any anything that was brewed in Kulmbach would have been called Kulmbacher. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I know from the tables I've got, even from the 1880s, they were brewing um, pale export as well as dark export. Mm -hmm. So they were brewing pale beer as well. But I'm not so sure that people outside of Germany would have associated that with Kornbach particularly. Um, I don't know if it's yeah. in that table. Um, I've, I've, oh, I've right, got a, I've got yeah. a different table which has... For the pale, this was, right. <laughs> My wait, apologies, wait. everyone. <laughs> I've, I've got a, I've got another table which has stuff which is um, export hell, export dunkel, 
uh, Hellas yeah. Export. So they've got different coloured beers, and, and this is from the right. uh, 1870s and 1880s. So, in fact, that's quite early. Um, yeah. 1870s, no one in Munich was brewing a, a pale lager at that point. They, they were only brewing dark lagers. I mean, that's like a good 15, 20 years before they started brewing pale lager in Munich. But it does mm -hmm. seem to have been, Kornbacher does seem to have been associated with specifically a dark beer, even though in Germany, people would have called Kornbacher anything that came from Kornbach. Um, right, it's just, regardless of, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's just a, yeah. it, it's just the conventions of Germany, which is, you'd name it after the town. So it, calling it Kornbacher in Germany wasn't it pinning it down to one specific style, but probably in other markets, it was associated with the type of beer that they were most famous for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the second to last or third to last one with the 56.42% apparent attenuation is of, of interest. <laughs> um, the Erste Kumbacher export beer buyer. Yeah, well, you should you you should you should look at um, analyses of Salvato. Yes. from the nineteenth century, and <laughs> and there's some of those that are only like uh, you, I think I've, yeah. some that are even under fifty percent attenuated. Right, you have one that is yeah low, maybe forty percent in um, the the vintage guide to homebrew beer, and and that one is. Yeah, it's it's mostly uh, carbs, calories, and extract. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> chemically well, you, speaking, you, you should see Scottish stouts from the twentieth century and see what some of those are like. Um, you've got some that are only forty percent attenuated, wow. that are one and a half percent ABV because they're starting out wow. at like ten thirty two mm. and barely fermented. They're, they're like they're like <laughs> things that. They're like drinks that would have been legal for people under age, because right. they're under because they're under one and a half percent ABV, which in Britain you're allowed to give to children. Right. Um, <laughs> so stuff that's basically like shandy. Yeah, it's certainly nourishing. There's there's no doubt. <laughs> well, that's often what they call the nourishing sure stout. Right. Oh goodness gracious! So um, questions. If the audience has any more questions, please feel free to uh, pose them. You've you've been a wonderful audience. Um, I guess I should thank Liz and and Liz uh, turn it over to you if um, if we are all uh, uh, wrapped with questions here. Yep, um, we have been monitoring Facebook as well, um, but I think you guys are just so darn informative that uh, there are no questions. Um, but I wanna thank you three very much for wrapping up uh, what has been a pretty great year for uh, Brazilian virtual events and, and us coming together in ways that are possible. Um, appreciate your knowledge and your time as well as everyone joining us today. Um, thank you very much for a, a great year for us. Um, 2021 uh, is going to allow us to share some more exciting news for the Chicago Bruseum um, with some more events and some great partners and other, other fun things. So thank you all for your continued support. And um, I'm excited that I will see you all in some way, shape or form uh, next year. And I hope you guys all have a very happy and healthy uh, new year. Thanks everybody. Okay. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Uh, Cheers, gang.